Is Lowry Markkinen really so good that the Utah Jazz should build their entire timeline around Lowry Markkinen? It's Ask LOJ edition of Locked on Jazz. You are Locked on Jazz, your daily podcast on the Utah Jazz. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. How are you? I'm David Locke, radio voice of the Utah Jazz, Jazz NBA insider. This is Locked on Jazz. Today, it's an Ask LOJ edition. You've lied out the shows. What is the Jazz timetable? How does it impact Lowry and extended Lowry? What do I think of the rookies? Has Chris Dunn starting lineup changed everything? Why the Jazz are the holders of the NBA championship belt? What? The NBA belt. I'll explain it to you in just a second. Uh, trade deadline. What ass, Are we in asset accumulation mode or talent accumulation mode? And are there young players available? A prospective trade. If the Jazz win 36 games, how do we feel about it? Are you wanting to make the playoffs? And some John Collins questions, Keontae George questions, and Laker questions. Plus, we'll try to get the points gained. So it's a busy, busy Friday show live from Bo- or from Boston. Not live. I am David Locke, radio voice of the Utah Jazz, Jazz NBA insider. This is Locked on Jazz. It's your daily podcast on the Utah Jazz, giving you insight, expertise, geeky numbers, and hopefully making it way better to be a Jazz fan each and every day. Thank you so much for making Locked on Jazz your first listen of the day. And thank you to all the everydayers out there who join us each and every day on the program uh, and making Locked on Jazz what it is. We are free and available on all podcasting apps as well as on YouTube. Please subscribe. Free, free, free. No paywalls, nothing. Uh, On YouTube, hit that little subscribe button. And then hit the bell, and you'll be notified every time we're live. All right. Uh, great bunch of questions that came in off X. Appreciate those of you that are still on that format. I should probably be using threads, too. Um, I will start to do that. Um, so I want to get to the first question of the day. Um, and that is, like, what is the Jazz timetable? But then that question comes in a lot. And then the second part of the question is all about whether Lowry's timetable and Lowry's extension and how Lowry's going to react. And I understand that Lowry's our best player. Um, and he's terrific. And he's probably a top 30, working toward a top 20 player in the NBA. But let me just ask you that question. If you're building this franchise, are you altering our timeline just because of Lowry? Like the premise of every question that I'm getting from everyone is, what do we do about Lowry? What about Lowry's extension? What happens if Lowry's not happy? Like, okay, let, let's talk about it. Like, there's a, I, I don't, I, and I have a whole theory on timetables too. I, I actually think they're made up, but just in, in an overall premise, I think Lowry's terrific. He's not Shea Gilgis Alexander. Like, if I'm Oklahoma City, I'm changing my timetable because of Shea Gilgis Alexander. He's not Jason Tatum. If I'm Boston, I'm changing my timetable because of Jason Tatum. He's not Giannis Antetokounmpo. He's not Nikola Jokic, right? He, he's terrific. But he's a top 30, maybe top 20 player in the NBA right now. I don't think he'll be all NBA this year. He's working toward it. But are you really changing your franchise timetable as many of these questions to me imply, because for Lowry. Like, I think that's a really hard question, actually. I don't think it's, I mean, part of it seems intuitive. The answer is no. The other side is he is our best player. He is a piece of what a championship puzzle would look like. Better not lose him. You can't lose him for nothing. You don't want to piss him off. You don't want him just to leave. It, it sets you back. So it's not a no-brainer. But every single question I'm getting about timetable all stems back usually to someone saying, what about Lowry's extension? So let me address those in reverse order. Lowry's extension, Lowry becomes extension eligible, if I understand it, at the end of this year. And there's really no way the Jazz extend Lowry based on the current rules, based on his market value as a top 20, 30 player, unless they do something with a bunch of cap space. Okay. So unless the Jazz use their cap space to kind of front load a deal for Lowry and then it works its way through, 
you cannot really extend Lowry unless he goes to free agency. Which is nerve-wracking, right? Because he's going to free agency. You better hope he likes it. You can pay him more. You have the right to pay him more. Other teams are a little hamstrung. Seems like you, sh- you, you if you do the research, and the Jazz do a good job with the Stephen Schwartz and the crew, kind of reading what the market would be, you'll, you'll have a pretty good idea going into that of whether or not you can sign him. The next question that gets to be, do you really want to use all of your cap space to extend Lowry? Are you better off using that cap space for something else and then taking the risk of Lowry going to market and being able, whether you can resign him or not? Now let me address timetable, because there's a lot of questions about timetables, about, oh, we're going to win 36 games. We... Let, let me go back to, I'm going to use Danny Ainge, actually, as the example, which is convenient. And I'm going to use Boston as the example, because we're here. So if you go back and look at Boston many years ago, they have Paul Pierce, which is really a, an incredibly, at the time, similar quality player to Lowry. He might have been a little bit better in the rank of players at the time, he was, but he was very, very good, but they were not winning. Okay, and Boston, if you were to like look at their timetable at the time, the answer would have probably been they're 20, 33 and 49. The next year, they're 24 and 58, which is really what I thought we were going to be doing this year. And if you really look at where you think they probably were in that 06, 07 season timeline, everyone's like, what's your timeline? Their timeline was that they were probably trading Paul Pierce and drafting Kevin Durant and starting the whole thing over. And instead, they lose in the lottery balls. They get the fifth pick of the draft instead of the second. They trade that pick to Seattle for Ray Allen. That Kevin Garnett becomes available. And by the end of the time, by the end of that offseason where they probably timetable wise if we talked about it in fe- in January and February about timetable our timetable would have been well we're probably trading Paul Pierce for future assets and we're starting over with that that's our timetable in 0607 they trade for Kevin Garnett they trade for Ray Allen they have Paul Pierce and they win the title they go from 24 wins to 66 wins i don't think that happens again but I think this idea that there's a timetable and that you're sitting on some clock that's going this direction and you're not picking up assets or making moves or, the, or that's dictating your moves, I think that concept's total hogwash. The Jazz have acquired a ton of assets and they're looking for opportunities to use them and they have caps, they have money and they're looking opportunities to use them and players. That's why they went after Drew Holiday. Because that was a player that they saw as someone who would make them better and help them move toward being a championship team. And so I think the idea of timeline is a little bit ridiculous. Now, I think if you have Shea Gilgis-Alexander and you have Jason Tatum and you have a top 10 player in the NBA, like to win a title, you need a top 10, a top 20, and a top 50 player. You have the top 10 piece. Okay, you better go all in, right? So when, when Denver traded Gary Harris... For Aaron Gordon, when Denver traded Will Barton for Kentavious Caldwell Pope, when when they did their moves, that was they had Nikola Jokic. They knew they were all in. Philadelphia has a ton of cap space in the offseason. They're down, they're balancing a little bit. Joel B, they better be all in. But we don't have one of those guys. So you're still playing a, a moving timeline that's available. So there's no defined, like, oh, we're going to be 36. This, and, and, and furthermore, it doesn't work that way. Like, you can't just decide, oh, we're going to go win 50 games in three years. Like, it doesn't work that way. It's too hard. So, we should be doing everything we can to keep Lowry. I don't know that we alter the franchise's timeline, which I think is hogwash, for Lowry. The concept, I think, is flawed. I think you do everything you can to keep Lowry, but you still make the best moves for the franchise. And I just don't think Lowry is a player at this stage of his career where he's a top 10 player in the NBA and you better go all in right now because you got a chance to win it. We can't win it with Lowry as our number one option. And if there's one thing that's been consistent this entire time from Danny Ainge and Ryan Smith, it's championship. It's not just being good. I've said this a million times. If I ran a franchise, it's probably kill me. If I ever had a hope to be a GM, it would kill me. I actually would build us to be a top four team in the Western Conference and then hope you get an ankle injury or two and just try to be sustainably pretty good. 
That's not what Danny Ainge and Ryan Smith have talked about for one minute ever since running this franchise. They've only talked about winning a championship. All right, what does the trade deadline look like? How do the rookies look? And why and what is the NBA championship belt? And why do the Utah Jazz own it right now? What? We own the championship belt? That's right. We'll tell you about that. We're just getting started here on Locked on Jazz today. Today's show is brought to you by our friends over at Murdoch Hyundai, located at 4646 South State Street, also located in Logan and in Linden. The great lineup of of Hyundai cars, the great family that the Murdochs are over 90 years, close to 90 years now in Utah, of giving you no regrets, experience, time in and time out. And the Hyundai lineup of cars, the SUVs start with the Palisade, the absolutely gorgeous Palisade, all the way down to the fun little zippy Kona with the Santa Fe and the Tucson in between. I'm driving the Tucson right now. It's terrific. Absolutely terrific. Loving that car. Own two Santa Fe's. Well, my kids now have them at college. So, And then I'm driving the Ionic 5. So I am true all the way through uh, with my Hyundai support. And uh, really, the Murdochs have been amazing uh, for all of it. So if you're going to stop by any of those three locations, Logan, Linden, or 4646 South State Street, see the brand new building there, feel free to email me first at dlock09 at gmail.com, dlock09 at gmail.com to make sure and we get you your VIP experience. Today's show is also brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. Get the applicants you need for free and post a job for free. At the start of the new year, every small business owner is asking the same question. Like, what do we do? Trust me, I'm doing it right now. And LinkedIn Jobs knows your success all depends on the team that you have around you. That's why LinkedIn Jobs has created the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. It's just not another job board. LinkedIn has a vast network of more than a billion professionals who makes it the best place to hire. Hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates. So it's the fact that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate in 24 hours. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs the number one in delivering quality hires versus leading companies. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on MBA. That's linkedin.com slash locked on MBA to post your job for free. Again, that's LinkedIn jobs. LinkedIn.com slash locked on MBA. LinkedIn.com slash locked on MBA to post your job for free. Thanks so much for making Locked On Jazz your first listen of the day. Locked On Sports Today on YouTube is the first ever 24 7 national sports channel and is there for you to grab all throughout the day. All the biggest stories, all the fun previews of NFL games today uh, should be really great. Locked On Sports Today. The first ever 24-7 national sports channel on YouTube. All right. Uh, next set of questions came in was all about the rookies. Um, and what do I think? And where's Taylor? Uh, Taylor's in the G League getting great experience playing 34 minutes a night, and I love the way this has happened. G League experience, taste the NBA, some good minutes, showed some skills, back to the G League to redevelop your skills and play. And I'm assuming back to the NBA at some point. Now, right now, it's pretty clogged. I don't know where he would possibly play. Um, And so maybe as we get trade deadline questions, some of that trade deadline stuff is goals are going to be to open up opportunities for other guys to play. Um, But with Walker, John, Kelly, Lowry, all kind of splitting those front court minutes and Ochai a little bit and Fontecchio, I, I don't. I don't really know where there's minutes for Taylor Hendricks right now. So what are my thoughts on the rookies? So Keontae, I feel like hit the, has just kind of hit the beginning of a a fatigue rookie wall. And it's going to be interesting to watch him fight through it for the next month. Now with Chris Dunn starting the burden on him is less, but I, and so I think that's probably a good thing for Keontae. Um, Keontae has shown they belongs. He looks like he belongs. He looks the part, all the perfect things in that regard. Rookies are not good in the NBA. Like I, One of the questions was, I was so excited for da, 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 with rookies. Like, okay, well, that's just like not true. Rookies do not help you win. None of the rookies in the NBA right now are helping anyone win. The best rookie in the NBA is Victor. He's not helping you win. Chet Holmgren's not really a rookie. He's the one that's probably helping you win. Brandon Miller's fine in Charlotte, but he's not helping them win. Um, And Keontae's not helping us win. Like, that's fine. Like, that's not a criticism. That's just a fact of rookies. The only thing I would say on Keontae that I'm going to keep an eye on for the next three months is the ball needs to go in the basket at some point. The amount of players that have shot below 40% in their rookie year 
that have then shot below and below 33% from three that have gone on to have successful careers is slim. So I'd like to see him push all of his shooting numbers up a little bit in the next few months, just so that's trending in the right direction. From a data standpoint, that's the one thing the ball needs to go in. Otherwise, size, athleticism, moxie, uh, want to, intelligence, guts, perfect. Looks great. For Taylor, I think the big difference on these two kids is that Keontae knew who's going to be an NBA pro since ninth grade, Keont- and Taylor knew since like last month. Not quite, but like literally like a 12 months ago was probably the first time he's like, oh, I'm going to be playing in the NBA soon. Um, and I think you can tell the difference between the two. I just think there's a different developmental process by who the two of them are as humans um, of where they are for Taylor. But the body of like the body and the athleticism and all the reasons you drafted Taylor Knight, they're still there. And I love the comment that Jake Scott makes on this. If Taylor Hendricks was ready to play at 6'9 and 220, he goes second. Then he's Brandon Miller. Right? If Taylor Hendricks at 6'9, 210, or whatever he is, with that body and that athleticism and that look, if he was ready to play, he would have gone second. We would never have seen him at night. Uh, and Bryce Sensabaugh, I loved him coming out of the draft as a pure scorer. He has shown his ability to do that. The franchise is really pleased with how much he's passing and didn't know, probably was has been a little bit pleasantly surprised by his ability to pass. Um, and so there's a real chance he can play. Uh, there is, he does need to athletically probably tighten up a little bit. He needs to physically tighten up coming off those knee surgeries, probably get in a little bit better shape and be better and thus be better defensively. So that's probably where we are. Uh, with the young kids. Spencer, who's been one of our longest standing um, listeners and who has not tweeted about anything I've said interesting in a long time, which means that I probably have not been interesting in a long time, uh, wanted to know about whether Chris Dunn into the starting lineup is really kind of, you know, jazz fans were clamoring to get THT out of the lineup, and now Chris Dunn's in instead of THT, and the jazz have started winning, and is that it? So let's just say yes, because that's what Spencer wants me to do, and that's even what he said, so that all jazz fans can feel good. I think Chris Dunn's been really, really valuable. Um, I don't know if I think it's that's true, by the way, but I was just going to go with that. Um, I think, you know, fact of the matter is, if you look at our on-off numbers, Taylor Hendrick, Taylor Horton Tucker has the biggest, second most positive defensive impact on the franchise uh, this year. Um, and we're better offensively when Taylor's on the floor than off the floor. So, it, you know, and what fans don't want to hear is Chris Dunn starting instead of Keontae George actually might be as big an issue to helping us win games as there is, because then Keontae's not, as a rookie, is not starting a point guard. Starting point guards in the NBA don't win games. Um, but we can go. I think Chris has brought a semblance of order, a calmness, a tenacity, a play hard, and defensively, he's pretty good, particularly on a play hard end. Offensively, it's great that we're better with him on the floor than off the floor because that's he's not great offensively. Like he sees the floor, he does a lot of things well. His lack of shooting to me is still somewhat problematic. He's finding ways as a veteran to get through it. Um, but it's not, you know, it's not surprising to me that we take our you know five or six or seven vet- veteran. No, no one likes this. This like fans hate this. This is true. It's like, I, it's really interesting to me. This is like such truth, and yet everyone hates this. It's not surprising to me that we go and take our five, six, seven year veteran, put him in the starting lineup, and we play better than we do if we have a rookie or a first or second year point guard in Taylor Horton Tucker. Like, that's just not surprising. There's just nothing, there's nothing about that that's surprising to me. Um, our offensive rating, by the way, is best when Chris Dunn is on the floor this year. So for all my problematic that he doesn't shoot and all that, I can really stick that where the sun doesn't shine because I'm wrong because our offensive rating in the 27 games that Chris Dunn has played when he's on the floor is better than any other player on the entire roster. So give him credit for the value he brings by bringing a semblance of order, a calmness, a togetherness, a ball mover, not a ball shooter, a ball mover. They're all positives. And so, yes, it has changed what we've done. I actually really think in the simplest form, the three guys that are playing more than they used to are 
Colin Sexton, Chris Dunn, and Simone Fontecchio. And in this most non-analytical manner, I would tell you, they play harder than anyone else. If you ask me who plays the hardest on this roster, Chris Dunn, Colin Sexton, Simone Fontecchio. Like, I love analytics. I love plus minus. I like to believe that the analytics actually show those things. That's kind of why. So truthfully, that's actually what I believe. And I, I think there's that's a large part of it. When Chris Dunn, Colin Sexton, and Simone Fontecchio check out of a game, they're tired every time. And I think there's really something to that. Um. Trade deadline questions. All right, I got to ask this question. I thought this was interesting. I'm just going to throw this out to YouTube. Would you trade Jordan Clarkson and John Collins for Zach Levine? No picks involved. I don't know if it actually works. Here's how I would evaluate whether to do that trade or not. Um, Do you feel Zach Levine's future trade value is more than Jordan Clarkson or John Collins? I actually think all of those are pieces that are probably not on our championship team or not on our main piece of one of our pieces. And so therefore, do you believe that any of those players give you more trade deadline value in two years than the other? So that would be, that would be my quick thought for you. I, that one's interesting. I think there's, I mean, other than they're humans and that that would impact Jordan, Jordan Clarkson and John Collins lives. And I see them every day. I think that one's super interesting. I think Zach Levine's really interesting because he's his value has plummeted since he's gotten injured because the minute he stopped playing, Chicago started winning. Are we in asset accumulation mode or are we looking for players and pieces at the trade deadline? We'll touch on that and I will explain to you still why the Jazz are owners of the NBA belt, the championship belt next. Today's show is brought to you in part by BetterHelp. Convenient, flexible, online therapy that can help you out. This world is uh, tough sometimes. And I actually was talking to Ron Boone about this the other day. This is totally revealing. I don't have totally feel like you get better at this as you get older. Like, I always thought that you got older and you'd understand your brain more and it would become easier and it would all make sense. And if you had any anxiety, or it'd go away. I'm not sure that that's true at 53 years old. So this is where better help comes in. Finding someone you can talk to, finding how therapy might be able to help you, figuring out what it is, I think, to be performance enhancing, right? How, how can you make yourself better? Better help is entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. I, you fill out a brief questionnaire. You get a ther- match with a licensed therapist. I think the best part about this is if you don't vibe with that therapist, you go get another one. If you're doing it not online, you got to find trying to get an appointment is impossible. Then trying to find the next person in town is even worse. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnNBA gets you 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash LockedOnNBA. And I sincerely apologize to all you 22-year-olds out there who thought that, like, when you got to be 53 and old like me and get all these wrinkles, that everything got easier. I'm not sure that's totally true. Um, it You have I, – I, we could get into a deep conversation about it. Um, I actually had a super deep conversation I wanted to have on the show today, and I just realized I'm not doing it. Um all right, my brain's everywhere now. This is why betterhelp.com slash locked on NVA. I want to welcome a new sponsor onto our show uh, today. I'm excited to introduce you to Hungry Root. Hungry Root, and we're going to get you 40% off your first delivery. I'm pretty excited for this. I am going to actually do this um, and have you for it. Um, Hungry Root is a healthy way to start 2024 uh rescue yourself from the short-lived resolutions of making this to the build healthy habits is the way to do it uh help uh hungry root 
kickstarts a week of healthy eating. You get groceries delivered right to your door. Health is number one. They make everyone eat a little bit healthier, whether it's gluten-free or vegan or dairy-free or low-carb. Incredible Netflix documentary right now if you want to watch that one on the uh, what you are, what you eat. Um, great value. Reduces food waste, saves time, and saves money. Plus, we give you 40% off and free veggies for life. It's the easiest way to get fresh, high-quality food delivered to your door. Healthy groceries, simple recipes, all in one place. Hungry Root goes beyond your weekly grocery haul with thousands of easy recipes that actually put your groceries to good use before they've forgotten in the back of the fridge. Go check it out right now. Hungry Root is offering Lockdown NBA listeners 40% off your first delivery and free veggies for life. Go to HungryRoot.com slash LockedOn to get 40% off your first delivery. That's HungryRoot.com. Don't forget the link so that uh, they know that we sent you and you get your 40% off at Hungry Root. I had like three super deep things, and I'm not going to get to any of them today. Kind of bummed about that. All right, championship belt. This is super cool. John Corrales, Locked On Celtics, has created this. The Denver Nuggets start with it at the beginning of the year. They have the championship belt. They have the championship belt. And then they play, and then they lose, and they lost to Minnesota. So then Minnesota ends up with the championship belt, and then it goes around. And by the way, we own the championship belt right now. I didn't know this, but I was listening to Locked On Celtics today, and we own the championship belt. So tonight... The Boston Celtics versus the Utah Jazz are all for the championship belt. I think Locked On's going to embrace this. We're going to talk about this all the time. We're gonna, this is a great concept. The, lo- the championship belt tonight, Boston Celtics, Utah Jazz. And Boston's loaded, by the way. The, ja- the Celtics right now are the number two offense, number four defense, number four shooting team, number seven team against the shot. They're top 15 in all four factors offensively. And they're top, 15, they're top 10 in three of the four factors defensively. They don't force turnovers. They take the most shots in the NBA from three, and they have six best shooting teams, so that's zone problem for us. The only thing, they allow a lot of threes, so that's how we're, we beat them. The only thing that happened the other night that was super interesting is they played Oklahoma City, and I watched the game, and Jason Tatum was not the best player on the floor. Shea Gilgis Alexander was the best player on the floor, which was crazy. So Boston versus Utah tonight for the championship belt. How about that? Pretty fun. All right. Trade deadline. Again, I think it's how the world plays out, and it's not set. But I actually think we're still in one. I think we have one last chance for asset accumulation. And I don't know what that I, – I'd be surprised if there's a first-round pick that comes with that. I, I don't know that we have a player that – if Justin Zana can pull off a first-round pick, that's pretty awesome. Uh, if we can get some good seconds and round out our seconds, our cadre of seconds, I think that is um, – I think that would be really, really great. Um, and help us out just to have more things to move and pieces of that puzzle. And I also think there's a level at the trade deadline is looking to the future of like who who needs time, right? There is a point here. Who needs time? Are we trying to make the playoffs was another question. One, if we make the play and we lose our pick, which might be fine. We're, the, the, the Jazz seem to be kind of fine with losing the pick to Oklahoma City because then you're unencumbered. Right now, we can't really not. This isn't entirely true. Just simplify it. Because our pick is encumbered, which means that one through 10 protected Oklahoma city and the next year, one through 10 protected and the next year, one through eight, we actually cannot trade the pick until uh, we can't trade any first round picks really until that picks conveyed. Once we give that pick to Oklahoma city, then Justin Zanuck gets the freedom again to go put picks out on the table and make trades and make deals. But right now, he can't trade our pick next year because we don't know if we have it. We can't trade the year after because we don't know if we have it. And we can't trade the pick the year after because he can't have it. And then because of that, I don't think he can trade the next year because that first, that year is tied up. So 24 draft no, 25 draft no, 26 draft no, 27 draft no, I don't believe so. So 28 first-round pick is the first pick we can trade. We don't want to trade that pick. That's too far out. That's too risky. So we don't know where we're going to be. So there is some value to us making the play and getting rid of that pick, giving it to Oklahoma City, and then being able to move forward in other future trades if we want to try to acquire some players by using the assets that we've acquired over time. Um, and so th- I think the Jazz are actually fine with losing this pick this year if they if that's what happens because it un- it means it becomes unencumbered. Um, but I don't – I honestly think this is hard for me. I- I'm just going to say this. This has been hard for me, as particularly as the play-by-play announcer of the team. There's never been one conversation by anyone about like a goal for this season because everything Ryan and Danny talk about is a goal of a championship in a long term. And so this is just we're looking this night. You and I look at this as night to night 
and in a context of a season and standings of a season, and our timetable starts on October and ends in April, and that's how we view it. I don't think anyone in the front office is viewing this that way. They're viewing an end result, which is a championship, which may happen in 2027, 2029, 2031, 2033, maybe when the Olympics are here. We can win a title and have the Olympics in the same year. And and so this is just a piece of that long-term puzzle. And so if we win 26, 36, or 46, it, it might not matter to them in this realm of that puzzle since we're clearly not just tanking for the sake of tanking. All right, great questions today. You guys are always super. I should do those shows more often because I always end up with four or five questions I don't get to. All right, let's do a quick points gained. Quick note on the trade the other day between Toronto and New York. I never gave this out. So Toronto got Emmanuel Quickly and uh, R.J. Barrett. O.G. Anobi and Preston Sichua. Here's really what happened in this trade. We got two really inefficient bigger guys and two really good wing players, guards. Quickly's a point four points gained, and O.G. Anobi's a point five. So they're basically the same impact offensively. OG's obviously a better defense player. RJ Barrett's a negative 1.4 and Preston Shachu is a negative one. So RJ Barrett's by far the worst player offensively in this draft. He's not good defense in that trade. So if some reason RJ Barrett becomes better, Toronto can win that trade. But otherwise it's RJ Barrett's pretty much a death nail on that on that deal. All right. Points gained if you are not and we're going to rush through this because I don't have enough time. Uh points gained is my offensive metric that judges Offensive players, it takes their amount of possessions they use on a given night, scoring opportunities, and then compares what they would do compared to an average player in the NBA. So, for example, Joel Embiid is the best in the NBA right now. He's using 27 scoring opportunities a night, and he scores 3.7 points more than an average player would with those 27 scoring opportunities every night. So he's plus 3.7 on a given night. The premise behind this for team building or roster construction is you want to see if you can get one of these guys that's really, really positive, and then you want everybody else on your roster to be even or so that if a team forces the ball out of Joel Embiid's hands, then everybody else on the roster is about average, then you can't catch Joel Embiid. The second premise is that negative players are far more detrimental than anyone realizes. Okay, here are the most positive offensive players in the league. Joel Embiid, one. Giannis Antetokounmpo, two. Shea Gilgis Alexander, three. Kevin Durant, four. Steph Curry, five. Chris Dapps, Przingis, six. What an acquisition. Jared Allen, seven. Tyrese Halliburton, eight. Jalen Johnson, nine. Atlanta got him back just recently. James Harden, 10. Harden's killing it. Jokic, 11. Kawhi Leonard, 12. Derek White, 13. Lowry Market, 14. Luka Doncic, 15. It's interesting. This used to be laden with bigs that dunk. Daniel Gafford's the first one. Chad Holmgren's after that. Flipping it around, the most negative, impactful offensive players in the leagues, the ones that are really pure death to your. Scoot Henderson is minus 3.4. Rookies aren't good. Uh, I'm trying to look quickly at how many games everyone's played here. Um, Cody Martin in Charlotte is a minus 2.6. Nikola Vucevic in Chicago is a minus 2.2. Theo Maladin is in Charlotte, is a minus 2.2. Cam Thomas is a minus 2.1. Xavier Tillman's a minus 2. In Memphis, Jordan Clarkson's a minus 2. Markel Fultz is a minus 2. He's injured right now, I believe. Andrew Wiggins in Golden State's a minus 1.9. Isaiah Livers in Detroit, minus 1.8. Jordan Poole, minus 1.8. Killian Hayes, minus 1.7. Karis Levert, minus 1.7. Victor Webb and Yama, minus 1.7. These players are suddenly, all these players just absolutely immediately negate a positive offense, the best positive, most offensive players in the league. There's only about 12 guys that are plus two. So it's really, really hard to be positive. And so if you're a plus two or something like that, like Lowry, that's really, really good. The problem for Lowry is that Keontae and Jordan, Jordan's a minus two and Keontae's a minus 1.6. So he goes away. Lowry's a 2.0. Kelly Lennox, a 1.2. Walker Kessler, a 0.7. Simone Fontecchio, 0.5. Playing Simone is important. Colin Sexton, 8.4. Okay, so, like, why are we winning? We've taken our most negative players in points gained. Taylor Horton Tucker, minus 1.5. Keontae George, minus 1.6. Jordan Clarkson, minus 2. And we've changed them with Simone Fontecchio, 0.5. Colin Sexton, 0.4. Kelly Olenek, 1.2. Like, it matters. 
Ochai Baji minus 0.2. John Collins minus 0.2. That's fine. That's just about even. Chris Dunn minus 0.5. And then Taylor and Taylor Horton Tucker minus 1.5. Keontae minus 1.6. And Jordan Clarkson minus 2. Hottest players in the NBA right now. The Joel Embiid is a 5.7 over the last 10. Followed by Kawhi Leonard, 5.3. Nikola Jokic, Miles Turner, Jalen Duran, Chris Apps, Przingis, Shea Gilgis, Alexander, James Harden's a 3.0 recently. Trey Young's on fire. Jared Allen, Jalen Williams in Oklahoma City, Alfred Shingoon, Norman Powell's playing great at 2.7, Aaron Gordon, 2.7, Chet, 2.5, Kevin Durant, 2.5. Coldest players in the NBA, and then we'll do the Jazz Top 10 as well. Coldest players in the NBA as of late. Mikel Bridges in Brooklyn is a minus 3.8. Cam Thomas a minus 3.7. Miles Bridges minus 3.7. Scoot Henderson minus 3.3. Darius Garland minus 3.4. Skipped over him. Spencer Dinwiddie, Jaden Hardy, DeAndre Ayton, Bogdan Bogdanovich, Cam Reddish, Sadiq Bey, Traveling Queen. I just want to say his name. Cody Martin, Reggie Jackson minus 2.6. Killian Hayes minus 2.6. Marcus Smart minus 2.6. Kobe White, for all the talk about him, is minus 2.5. Dorian Finney-Smith, Brandon Miller, rookie, minus 2.4. Rookies aren't good. They get good, but they don't start good. None of them do. R.J. Barrett minus 2.2. Tim Hardaway Jr. minus 2.2. Xavier Tillman, bam, out of Bayou. Struggling. Interesting. Uh, there for Miami and your Utah Jazz over the last 10 games and points gained. This will be interesting because we're playing really well. I'll bet you Jordan's about even, and that swings us dramatically from him being negative to even. Uh, Lowry Markin at 1.9, Kelly Olenek 1.8, or excuse me, Walker Kessler 1.8, Kelly Olenek 1.5, Colin Sexton 0.5, Simone 8.2. Jordan is even. Changes who we are. It's a massive change right there. If Jordan's even, we're good. If Jordan's minus two, we struggle. Ochai minus 0.2. Taylor was back to minus 0.2 before going to the bench. John Collins minus 0.4. Chris Dunn minus 0.7. Keontae minus 1.2. That is your locked on jazz points gained. That is your quick take. Ooh, long show today. Sorry about that. Let's see if I can get it uploaded in time. Thank you very much for tuning in. We will be back postcast tonight and tomorrow in Philadelphia now, heading you the first ever 24-7 sports channel, Locked On Sports Today on YouTube. Have a good one.